Hello everyone please take a seat and let me tell you a tale from the mist of history with sometimes can go up to the skies. Appearance of fighter aircraft. As we can see, at the beginning of the war, the planes served only for intelligence. If the other side was tracked down by the other side in preparation for some successes before the reconnaissance planes, it often ended in unexpected and sad results. Therefore, as soon as the soldiers heard the propeller, they were in a hurry to hide when they were not noticed by the invaders from the air, a natural refuge was perfect for that. The Allies had acquired shameful German scouts, so they falsely raped their commanders about their presence in front of the lines. But the mysteries were not enough. There was an urgent need to get rid of the shallows of obsessive enemies. Initially, attempts were made to kill them by shooting from the ground. As usual, the Germans were better prepared for this, from 1909, already having an anti-aircraft cannon. The Allies relied on their machine guns, but in Germany, the knowledge raised the ceiling of their planes and did not reach the bullet pilots. The British and French then adapted level cannons for sailing into and out of the plane with delayed action grenades. This means that the last ones can be shot down in front of reconnaissance planes only by shooting from nearby planes. Thus, as soon as enemies appeared in the sky, to defend their territory from the invading planes, their own planes took off into the air. At that time, military aviation, which was still in the embryonic phase, used only small arms. Aircraft pilots fired from revolvers. When the pilots flew in pairs, the second pilot was shooting next to the pilot sitting. In those days, pilots defended themselves by means that make us laugh today. Often heavy stones or bricks were loaded onto the plane, and when they flew in front of the planes from above, they shed them to break the fuselages constructed of wood and materials. These primitive methods of combat were abandoned when second pilots with machine guns settled next to the pilots. However, the situation changed substantially when the 1915 April the 19th on the German front to the ground. A powerful plane from French aviator Roland Garros crashed. The Germans knew that Garros had managed to shoot down five enemy planes in 15 days, an unheard of at the time. And now they smiled at the opportunity to find out how the French pilot managed to do it, because Garros didn't have time to blow up his plane while flying. After a careful examination of the machine, the Germans were surprised to discover that the pilot himself could shoot from the roll of a bullet mounted on a propeller tip. The Germans marveled at not realizing how it was possible to shoot through a propeller. In this case, they did not lack imagination. At first, the Germans thought that the plane was equipped with a sophisticated device that fired while rotating a propeller. However, the French protected the propeller blades from ammunition by attaching the simplest sheets of metal from the sides. Uh -huh. From this construction, pompously named guiding mechanism, bullets bounced and did not get into the propeller, while others flying straight flew to the target. But the bounced bullets flew anywhere and posed danger, and a lot of ammunition was wasted. German designers decided not to install machine guns on their planes in this way. After rolling their sleeves, they set about creating a mechanism that better reflected the progress of German technology. The Dutch engineer Antonio Fokker, who built the best German aircraft of the time, the Fokker and Albatros, recalled that a year before the war, he had bought a patent for a mechanism from the Swiss engineer Franz Schneider, which was designed to solve the problem. The mechanism stopped the cull gunner from firing when the propeller blades were in a vertical position. Schneider's invention was very useful, but it also had major drawbacks. If the mechanism broke down, damaged the propeller or clogged the machine gun. Fkar improved the Swiss invention and developed a synchronizer or otherwise a breaker. 1915 such mechanisms have been incorporated into all German fighters, which have become far superior to rivals the French and British, who break the breaker. However, 
Allied engineers also did not and soon installed similar equipment in their aircraft. Advances in technology have led to the emergence of new, effective tactics. For example, squadrons were formed that attacked enemy fighter jets at their airports without danger, before the enemies even sent you even reconnaissance aircraft. The French were proud to have an ultra-fast and agile Nieuport II, whose appearance over Verdano stunned enemies and proclaimed Allied dominance in the airspace. To the surprise of the French, the Germans did not weigh their hands. Created a highly mobile squadron system that could be deftly spread across the front. Each squadron was commanded by experienced pilots, the so-called ace. The name seems to have been revealed to a German journalist during a visit to von Richthofen's Boeing Jagstar from 11. When she was surprised by the colorfully painted aeroplane fuselages and huge, Tents were erected throughout the front. The observing reporter exclaimed, This is not a squadron, but a circus. It is suspected that this anecdotal situation was conceived, but it can explain the nickname of the squadron system. Their opponents had turned from them dominion in the heavens. By the way, in April, the Allies turned bloody in April, a huge number of soldiers were killed in a month. Fondrich Toffen's team added 89 enemy planes four times more than other German pilots. 1917 in June Fondrich Toffen was assigned to lead three more fighter squadrons, which were merged into a new group, Jag Jeschweder 1. His eye-catching planes, his brother Lothar flew in yellow and other German pilots in green or blue, as did risky maneuvers in the Dane earned another circus-like comparison from enemies in France and Britain, they called the new Boeing a flying circus. Or the Richthofen Circus. At that time, the planes fought in groups of up to 50 planes, but the individual abilities of each pilot were more important than the overall tactics of the team. The pilots found a medium where everyone could unfold in person. The pilot was assigned an aeroplane to fly alone, and the equipment was individually adapted. Even the color of the plane was chosen only by its pilot. Despite the principle of camouflage, the pilots chose bright colors, which unfortunately helped not only friends but also enemies to spot the plane faster. The best known example was von Richthofen's red. Color triple. Many pilots especially Germans, are also known. Edited to stand out and drew his initials on the outside of the plane as if medieval warriors mottled their shields with coats of arms. The pilots of the First World War did not stand out with modesty and received the respect and admiration they caused for the people and other soldiers. As they crossed the clear and sunny sky, they saw their compatriots swarming in the ditches and realized that they were the babies of the world. And on the battlefields that sacrificed their lives, soldiers looked upwards knowing that pilots who would land on the ground after the air operations would be able to change, receive hot food in the airport kitchen and rest quietly until the next day, away from deprivation, danger and bombings in dirty ditches. However, as often happens, the exterior was deceptive. Compared to the war in the trenches, the seemingly quiet daily life of the pilots was marred by the same brutal drama and accompanied by death. The pilots were killed every day, and it was getting harder and harder to hide it. During the war, most pilots were killed just three to six weeks after joining the service. 1917 in April, the average showed that the life of one pilot behind the wheel of an aeroplane was disrupted by just 17 and a half hours. Becoming a pilot of a military aircraft was not easy. The danger of death even during test flights. The French Aviation Force estimates that 2,000 of former pilots were lost during the training alone. Another test of happiness awaited the young pilot who had successfully completed the training, the mission of the first. A number of them said goodbye to life during their debut. The brief in period and the first baptism of fire differed as day and night were fatal. The slightest, 
only mistake the pilots of the aircraft paid for with their lives. And the babies of happiness were called by those who paid off soon become. And after happily practicing the selection of the first mission and gaining experience, the pilots could hope for greater success to achieve victories and even become aces. All novice pilots longed to reap as much power as possible and earn the title of deserving pilot. German von Richthofen, who shot down 80 enemy planes, had the honor of becoming the best pilot in World War. Rene Fonck was not far behind. The Frenchman had 75 victories, and the third place was won by Willis, William of Bishop, who defeated 72 enemy fighters. In fourth place was another German Ernst at a minus 62 victory, and in fifth place was the victory of the British Edward Manock minus 61. Others in a row were Australian Robert Little minus 47 successful attacks, Italas Francesco Baracca minus 34 wins, Ahmedi Rickenbacker minus 26 victories, and Russian Alexei Kasik of 17 killed enemy planes. But behind the ask list are hiding thousands of pilots who were not destined to achieve so many victories. The daily exchange of pilots spoke of silent tragedies. Every afternoon, items belonging to pilots who had died during the Eastern missions were taken out of the tents so that the new pilots who replaced them would find clean bedrooms without the slightest hint of the pilots who had just arrived a few hours ago. The ghost of death at the airports did not frighten the soldiers, on the contrary, it only emphasized and encouraged the enjoyment of the pleasures of the land. In general, no one expected and considered when the war would finally end, and the pilots looked at the death with cynical skepticism, trying to make the most of it and survive another day. Realizing that everyone can be the last, and it is not worth fighting for what will be tomorrow. At the end of the day, the surviving lucky ones left after the missions hung in taverns decorated with the remains of enemy planes shot down with victory trophies. In the taverns hung writing boards marking the achievements of the pilots every day. Bottles of whiskey or cognac traveled from hand to hand, and the pilots shared the impressions of the day's events in a noisy, handy way, depicting the maneuvers of the planes. Intoxicated men often drew some dirty table rack or, to catch a sad pathos, sang an anthem in honor of those who died that day. The siblings were more responsive to the bedrooms at midnight, because they had to be on their feet again before dawn. And those who longed to continue the fun drank until they were intoxicated, or drove to the nearest hostel, from where they returned directly to the wheel of the plane. Today, the epicardial lifestyle of the pilots of the First World War inspires us with admiration and even respect in whatever is silent here, even though we know the price these men paid for enjoying the stormy experiences. From sepia-painted portraits, they look at us with an eternal smile, radiating a natural youth and boundless confidence, as if confirming that they did not know what the fear of death was. As per usual please don't take my words for a fact I don't want to misguide you just because I made a mistake. Nevertheless hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day.